right, welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in for another ATP Ride Report webinar session. Um, if it's your first time joining us, my name is Ashley Fulon. I oversee airline and corporate partnerships for ATP. And today we have Hillary, Hillary Patterson joining us. She is the Senior Manager of Corporate Recruitment for Mountaineer Cargo, and she's going to be discussing a career path in cargo opportunities uh, with Mountaineer Cargo today. So Hillary, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ashley. It's a pleasure to be here to speak with everybody. Perfect. Well, all well, everyone's getting signed in. We're going to go ahead and um, put this push this poll out to you. So go ahead and let us know if you're here to learn more information about cargo operations at Mountaineer Cargo, if you have already potentially applied, or if you are just here and also interested in learning more about that FedEx um, the Purple Runway Program. So it looks like so far everyone is here to learn more, Hillary, and they are also interested in uh, finding out about that Purple Runway Program. So thank you everyone for voting. Oh, we do have a couple as well that have applied. Hillary, to start, can you please uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and how long you have worked for Mountaineer Cargo? Sure. Um, well, I started my uh, adventure in aviation as a teenager. I actually started when I started taking flying lessons at the uh, young age of 16 and then became a flight instructor. Did that uh, off and on for about 10 years cumulatively um, and then uh, moved into pilot recruiting. I, I took a break. There were some years there where I did some some non-aviation things. Um, you know, we we took a hit uh, back during September 11th, so I kind of branched off in a different direction for a little bit after that. Uh, but you know, always came back to aviation, uh, came back into uh, pilot recruiting, uh, and then got the uh, the management position here at Mountaineer Cargo. Did uh, strictly pilot recruiting here at Mac for about a year and a half, um, and we got fully staffed, which was great and moved into all recruiting here at MAC. So all of our aviation positions. So Perfect. that's what brought me here today to speak with you all. Great, well to start then, can you tell us just a little bit more about the history of Mountain Air Cargo? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the company was founded in 1974. Uh, we started out as a part 135 on-demand charter company. Uh, originally at Little Mountain Airport, we're not there anymore, but uh, that's where everything began. And then uh, shortly thereafter in 1979, we formed the business relationship with FedEx. Um, and we have, they have been our customer ever since. Uh, we have a great relationship with them. Um, it is the only airline that we operate. We, we have some other customers on the maintenance side, but as far as the airline piece, uh, FedEx is our sole customer. We do fly uh, under part 135 and 121, so I'll delve into that when we talk about the different aircraft that we fly and which ones are flown under what parts, because that does affect our hiring minimums. Um, but we do fly under both of those uh, regulations. We started flying uh, part 121 in 1988, so we got our certification to do that. So we've been doing both for, for quite a while. Um, our, currently, our corporate offices are located in Denver, so they moved from Little Mountain Airport to here. Uh, we're in Denver, North Carolina, not, not Colorado. I get that a lot with the mountain name, the Mountain Air Cargo, and the, and the Denver, but it's Denver, North Carolina. It's just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, about 30 miles, so uh, pretty rural area here, but uh, you get the taste of the big city if you want. It's close by, so a uh, great location. And all of our, um, our corporate offices and our operational personnel are here. So um, all of our uh, flight dispatchers, maintenance controllers, basically flight operations is run out of here as well. Um, then we have a maintenance-based operations in Kinston, North Carolina. It's more out by the coast. It's about four hours from here. That's our heavy maintenance facility. Uh, we operate and maintain all of the aircraft. FedEx owns them, but we fly them and we fix them. Uh, so that happens out there in Kinston, as well as uh, some other outside maintenance customers that we have there as well. Um, so over all of these years, it's been many. Um, Max transitioned from a small part 135 operator. Uh, they started out flying Beach 18s to now being one of the largest small feeder aircraft operators in the world. Perfect. And then what type of aircraft do you presently fly? 
So presently we fly Cessna caravans uh, and the count there, we have 25 Cessna caravans that we currently fly. Um, and then we have eight ATR 42s and nine ATR 72s that are currently in our fleet. Uh, we operate 150 flights a week, uh, serve 55 cities. And this is our coverage area is uh, Eastern half of the United States. So our aircraft are all up and down the Eastern half. And we do have uh, a couple in the Caribbean as well. Perfect. And then are you taking delivery of any new aircraft in the future? We are. We are already gearing up for the Cessna 408 Sky Courier. Um, that's going to be coming um, in the, I want to say, probably the first or, sec or second quarter of next year. So probably spring or summer, we're going to be getting our first 408s coming in. Um, so there, you can see a picture of it there on the slide. So it's a, a twin engine high wing turboprop aircraft that's being designed uh, by Cessna, especially for FedEx. Uh, we are the launch customer for that. So we're pretty excited. We're gonna be getting the first ones. These will be flown under part 135 as well. Um, although our ATRs are flown under part 121, these will be added to our 135 fleet. So we're pretty excited about those. And then are these additions to the fleet or will they uh, replace the 208s? Um, for now, these will be additions to the fleet. Um, I think there's still plans to fly the, uh, the 208s for a few more years. So we don't have any data yet on exactly what locations these will be flying in uh, or where they'll be based. Uh, they will be in our area, uh, hopefully. Um, because we're going to be operating them. But um, as far as we know, they are additions to the current fleet. Perfect. And then will um, the addition of, of them, will that provide the opportunity to potentially hire lower time pilots? Absolutely. Um, we have a second in command program I'm going to talk to you about that we plan on, although these are going to be certificated to fly single pilot, uh, we are implementing a pilot development program for these aircraft that will allow us to put second in command pilots in there at much lower minimums. Um, so we're, we're pretty excited about that, that maybe we can, you know, bring in some hires at some lower hours than where we are right now. Perfect. And then um, speaking of modernization of your fleet, can you also talk about how you are doing that with the ATR? Yes, and I don't know if any of you saw, um, but we did post it on our Facebook uh, yesterday. But uh, we have some new ATR 72600Fs coming. And I saw a video where it took a flight yesterday, it took its first flight yesterday, and we posted that video. So we were pretty excited about that. Um, but, but we are going to have some new ATRs. Um, these will be replacements to some of our older 42s in the fleet. Um, so I, th I don't know if there'll be direct swap outs, but the plan is, is to, this is sort of a fleet upgrade. So there will be some swapping out of some of our older aircraft on the ATR side that we have. Awesome. And then, um, if we were to take a look at your, uh, route map, can you just tell us a little bit more about, um, this and then where someone who is flying for Mountaineer cargo might be based? Absolutely. So you can see our structure there, eastern half of the U.S. Um, now these aren't all bases. This is, you know, these are points that we fly to. Uh, and these are just some of them. I don't think all of the caravan routes are on here because it would be really cluttered. Um, but we do have coverage all the way, as you can see, up in the northern United States. On um, We do uh, go down into the Caribbean. We, we have, right now we have an aircraft in uh, Puerto Rico. So we have one that's based there. Um, there are some flights that we are assisting with with another feeder uh, and some caravans that are also down in the Caribbean as well. Um, so, you know, it just depends on, you know, aircraft and flight loads. Sometimes we do more flying in the Caribbean than we're currently doing. Um, so a little bit of, about our base structure. Um, uh, this definitely gives our pilots a wide range of experiences. You can see, you know, the coverage area is pretty broad. Um, a lot of these, this is a, a lot of these locations, there's usually just one aircraft base there that does that little route back and forth. Um, so like for instance, if you look at New Bern there on the coast, that EWN, it goes, to, there's a run that goes to Raleigh every night and comes back, goes to RDU every night and comes back, and then a, a Wilmington run that goes from ILM to, to Raleigh every night. And it's literally just an out and back. So in a lot of those locations, we just have one aircraft base there 
and a few crew members that staff it uh, and a mechanic um, to, to take care of the aircraft. And that's pretty much it. Um, and we'll talk, and I just want to explain that to you when we get to talk about basing and, and how that works for you and quality of life, just kind of wants you to picture that. Um, we do have a couple of hubs where we have multiple aircraft that branch out, and that would be Memphis and Indianapolis. So you can see them there on the map where they have several lines shooting out from them going to different places. So there it's a little bit different structure. Um, you would have multiple crews. I think we usually staff 10 to 12 pilots in those locations to cover the runs that occur out of there and then a small team of, of mechanics as well to take care of the aircraft. But, you know, aside from those hubs, everywhere else is usually just a one aircraft, one, one line flight out and back. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And so one of the benefits of uh, cargo operations that I know that you want to talk about um, is the stability. So as a result of COVID, obviously we're seeing a number of students and instructors that have, you know, a really an increased interest in cargo operations. So can you speak a little bit about how operations uh, at Mountain Air Cargo have changed, if any, uh, since March? Absolutely. And that's why I said, why be a cargo pilot? Um, so on the picture there, you know, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster lately for, for people in the, in the airline industry. Um, uh, luckily for us, the cargo airlines tend to remain stable during the industry fluctuations. Um, you know, as you can see, just from the length of time of, of our partnership with FedEx, um, you know, a lot of airlines come and go. We have been there and we have been steady. So, um, you know, during with, with current events and the way things have happened, we have remained steady. Uh, we've been flying all of our lines. We've been flying all of our aircraft. We have not furloughed anyone on the flight or the maintenance side or as a company as a whole uh, and we certainly don't have any plans to um, the the cargo loads you know they have stayed pretty steady um, throughout this so um, you know that that's that's something to be said for cargo is that there's a lot of stability there when you're looking at employment um, you know I always say it, it, the boxes always have to go um, you know, even if the passengers don't, the, the boxes do. And, and I say, if I, you know, if, if I keep ordering from Amazon the way that I do, we will all have jobs for a long time. <laughs> um, and another reason to be a cargo pilot, so there's the stability piece, right? Uh, it tends to be more stable uh, of an industry. Um, and there's a better quality of life due to the schedule structure. So as you saw in, in our little uh, flight diagram there in our in our geographic diagram. It's a daily out and back from base. So if you're at one of those locations, uh, and I'll just use the New Bern, we looked at that one that was on the coast there. It's literally, you know, you go into the airport at night, you fly up to Raleigh, you come home in the early morning, and you're home. Um, so you you have the opportunity to be home every day. You're not doing those multiple trips, you know, multiple day trips away from home. Um, and most schedules have weekends off. The majority of our schedules have a Monday night start and uh, they have the last leg when they're coming back Friday morning, early morning, uh, you're done. You're done for the week. Um, we have a few schedules out there that do a, you know, leave Friday night and come home early Saturday, but then after that they're done. Um, so it's a pretty nice schedule as far as quality of life. It is most schedules are overnight. So that's probably the one drawback, but our pilots say they like it because there's less traffic and less radio traffic and, you know, they kind of have the place all to themselves. So, so they don't seem to mind the, the night flying. So quality of life wise, you know, it can be better. Um, and, you know, I hear a lot of people tell me that they like it because the boxes don't talk. <laughs> Sure. And so um, with this type of schedule, it sounds like it's the same out, like set hours every every day. Yes, yes the um, sometimes it, there's some slight fluctuations. Um, FedEx dictates the schedule. So we don't really have any control over that. But yes, week to week, it, it, you're typically the same schedule for years, you're doing the same run. You know, if you're at that base, it's the same back and forth week to week to week. Perfect. And then how many um, hours on average do your pilots log annually? Um, about three to 400. Um, so as you can see, it's typically about an hour out and an hour back every night. So I, I would say that's the one thing that, that we don't have. You know, if you're looking to come here to build time quickly, you know, and take the, the express lane to getting your hours, 
then this probably isn't where you want to be. Um, you know, there's a trade-off. There's a much better quality of life, but you don't get as many hours. Um, you know, our pilots don't have to work very hard. Um, so, so yeah, it's about three to 400, and that really is going to fluctuate. Some of the, the lines that we have have higher times than others. You know, some of them are literally 45 minutes there and back. Uh, some of them are an hour and 15. So um, it, it just kind of depends where you are and, and the hours, but that's the average. Perfect. Okay. And then before we move on from this, I just want to highlight too, um, I looked on Tuesday at Argus's data and as of the Tuesday morning, I think a year or year over year for the month of September, cargo was up 2.62%. So um, just another point to drive home the stability of being on the, the cargo side of the industry. Yeah, and, that's encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll definitely, we'll dive more into the specifics in a little bit, but in a broader sense, can you just talk about how um, being, how does a pilot, you know, someone that's interested in flying for mountain air cargo get started? Yeah, um, well, you know, of course, the first step is to, to meet the pilot hiring minimums, and those vary uh, based on the aircraft that we have. So I have a couple of slides after this, I'm sorry, have a couple of slides after this that um, will we'll break down the minimums for you so that you can see what those are. Um, and then I, I get this question a lot of, you know, I've got to build time to get to your minimums. What should I do to build time? Um, how you build time does matter. So my advice to that is think about what, you know, think about the next step that you're going to take and, and do something where you're building time that is going to help develop those skills for the next step. So what I would recommend is steer away from anything that is all VFR flying. Um, you know, as you can see, we operate in, you know, our, so for instance, our, our caravans, um, they operate single pilots uh, up in bad weather up in the north. So those instrument skills need to be sharp. You know, and that's something we're gonna be looking for in the interview. We're gonna stick you out there in an airplane by yourself up north in the bad weather. We wanna make sure those skills are solid. Um, so anything that will get you into that environment, flight instructing is a great way, uh, you know, because you are always teaching and training and, and reiterating all those things and checklists and safety and, you know, emergencies. So that is always good or any type of flying that kind of exposes you to, to that, to the, the instrument flying, you know, any kind of 135 flying, anything like that. Um, it's just going to help you further develop the skills so that when you come to us, you're going to do better in the interview, you're going to do better in training. Um, you know, that's not to say that if you did that type of flying that we wouldn't hire you, but, you know, we're looking for, you know, are you going to make it through training? You know, we, we want to make sure you're successful because if you're not, it's not good for you. It's not good for us either. Um, so we, we do look at how you've built your time and how that's going to translate into, you know, the next steps for you here at Mountain Air Cargo. Um, and then another way to become a cargo pilot, like I mentioned, we have the SIC pilot development program. We're currently working on implementing that in the caravans as well. Um, so that, that will be limited hiring, but uh, we'll probably roll that out before we get those 408s. So we'll have that program up and running. Um, I want to say, you know, we're, we're shooting for hopefully, you know, first part of this uh, 2021 coming up, maybe sooner. Um, you know, it's, it's been developed, the, it's been written, we're just in the process of approvals and you know, FAA paperwork, you know how that goes. Um, so that one's already developed. Um, and then as we roll out the 408s, that will be something that will come along with it. Um, originally, this program wasn't designed for our 208. So um, we, we had some more hoops we had to jump through to, to get that going. But um, that will provide for some lower hiring minimums. Keep in mind, like I said, we're, you only build about 300 hours a year. We really don't want somebody in the, you know, being an SIC for longer than that, just because, you know, you're going to get bored, especially in the, in the 208s. Um, so think about that as you're, you're going to be about 300 hours away from the hiring minimums that you would qualify under is kind of where we want you to come in on the SIC program. So, and I'm, and I'm speaking 300 hours strictly right now for the, for the 208s. That might look a little bit different in the 408s because it's a multi-engine aircraft, you know, and you're building a different type of time. But for the 208s, we're looking at bringing them in about 300 hours sooner than we would normally be able to. Okay, 
Perfect. And I know. Um, and then uh, the other piece is the Purple Runway Pathway Program. Um, so that is something that once you're hired with Mountain Air Cargo that you can apply for and participate in, which will be, take you to the next step of, of being a cargo pilot, which would be to be a cargo pilot for FedEx. Um, so I'll explain a little bit more about how that program works when we get to those slides as well. But, you know, that's a pathway that you can start here and then you can continue that career and hopefully finish your career and uh, stay on the cargo pilot side. Perfect. Well, I know that we discussed your fleet a little earlier. So can you just walk us through to start hiring minimums for the ATR? Sure. Um, so the hiring minimums for ATR first officers, um, they, they are flown under part 121. So they are going to be the ATP or the restricted ATP hour minimums. So um, the restricted ATP has a couple of categories that people may fall into. Uh, if you're a military aviator, then you would qualify at 750 hours to be a first officer. Uh, if you've gone to an accredited aviation university program that qualifies you for the restricted ATP minimums with a four year degree, it would be 1000 hours, uh, 1250 for a two year degree. Um, if you haven't gone that route and you're not doing the Aviation University, and, and some people do it in conjunction with their flying, some don't, but if you're not going that route, then it would be 1,500 hours. Um, we don't require a degree for hire. Um, you know, the FedEx, FedEx does have that as part of their hiring requirements. So for Purple Runway, there would be a requirement there, but to be hired at Mountain Air Cargo, you do not need a degree. So, you know, you could come in at the 1,500 hours with no degree, and uh, we are fine with that. Um, and then on the bottom there, you'll see the breakdown of the hours. So, um, of course, you must hold a fixed wing commercial multi-engine land with instrument rating. Um, you have to hold a first class medical, current passport, be a U.S. citizen or have a work authorization. Um, and then 500 pilot in command and uh, 50 hours of multi-engine land as well. So there's a little exception there to the 50. Um, we can hire you. These are the ATP minimums. You have to be at that to pass your check ride once we put you through training, but we can hire you with 25 hours of multi um, because you will get the other 50 in the sim as part of our training program. So it, it depends on how you've built the first 25. Um, and if it's been in the aircraft, then you shouldn't have a problem. We can get you the other 25 to meet the minimums as part of the training program. We do offer the ATP CTP course. So if we're bringing you in as a first officer and you, and you just have your commercial multi-engine, we'll, we'll provide the ATP CTP course for you prior to going to training. So we'll be able to, you know, to cover that for you. Perfect. And then for the uh, 208, the hiring minimums are obviously lower, correct? Uh, yes, yes. If you are the 1500 hour ATP pilot, yes, yes they are. Um, right. So, um, so this one, you only need to have a fixed wing commercial single engine land uh, with instrument rating and the hiring minimums are 1200 total time. And then, you know, there's the breakdown 500 uh, PIC, 500 cross country, 100 night, 75 instrument. 50 is, is in, in, the way they put this in verbiage, in actual flight, not in actual um, IFR conditions, but in the aircraft. So 25 of that can be in a simulator. Um, in the aircraft simulated or actual is fine for the 50. Um, and you only need a second class medical to fly the, um, the 208. So we actually have uh, several pilots on our 208 fleet that are retired 121 pilots. So either they retired from our ATR fleet, we actually have a retired FedEx pilot that flies our 208s for us um, because you know they're under 135, so they don't have that age restriction of 65 like the 121 does, and a second class medical. Um, the only place that uh, the we require the first class medical for the 208 is uh, if it's international or if it even if it originates, say, in uh, Fort Lauderdale, if it's going down uh, out of the country, going international, then it would need a first class. But uh, all of our domestic stuff, second class medical is fine. Okay, and um, for the cross country, that just needs to be point to point, correct? Yes. Okay, 
And then um, have you discussed the hiring minimums for the 408? We have not. Um, we, we have some preliminary numbers that we're looking at because again, it's certificated for uh, single pilot operations. So I can tell you that the total time number is looking like it's going to be around 1800 hours total time for that. The other breakdown we're we're still working on that. Um, you know, we're still looking at what that needs to be. Um, I expect that we'll probably have that published soon. I'm hoping maybe around the first part of the year. Um, if you go to our website, you will see these published on our website. If you go into the to the um, pilot pathway section, you will see all of that. And we'll definitely post the 408 minimums on there. And of course, I'll blast it out on the social media as soon as we have everything solidified. But it's going to be a little bit higher, um, you know, due to it being multi-engine single pilot certification. Perfect. Okay. And uh, now I know this is something that a lot of our viewers voted that they would or give, give feedback they'd like to hear more. So can you just talk about as a FedEx feeder, um, you're one of the, obviously the operators that is part of the Prevola Runway program. So can you really um, just give us a little bit more information on this and talk about how it really helps to establish that defined pathway to FedEx? Absolutely, we are very excited about Purple Runway. Um, this program just rolled out a couple of years ago, uh, right after I started working for Mountain Air Cargo. Um, so this is a pathway program that will get you to an interview at FedEx. Um, I'm very proud to say that three of our pilots have already gone through this pathway and been hired and are now at FedEx. Uh, we have 10 more that are currently in the program as well uh, in various phases. So. How do you become part of Purple Runway? Um, once you're hired, uh, six months into employment, you can apply. And the six month is, is so that we make sure that you have successfully completed training, you're on the line, you have passed that, that, that training portion, basically. Um, so application involves, we'll just send your, your resume and some basic information uh, over to FedEx and let them know that you're applying for Purple Runway. Um, basically, what they're looking for at that point is that you meet the, the eligibility criteria aside from the flight time, which they know that you're not going to have, but that you would meet all their other pilot hiring criteria, you know, background stuff and things like that. Um, and then uh, we'll get you to sign the program agreement once they approve. Um, and then it's 36 months from the date that you basically are approved into the program that you have to be with the feeder. Um, Realistically, it's going to take you that long to build the flight time anyway, so that, that's not a, you know, a real binding or, or slowing down of, of, you know, your progression. It's literally, you know, three years and you can be off to FedEx, so it's, it's a pretty good timeline. Um, so there's a few steps in the program. Some of them occur uh, within the first year, but most of them occur at the end of the program. So pretty much the flow is once you get signed up um, within the first Typically, it's the six months to a year. You'll go to Memphis for what we call the summit and the NEO and the cognitive testing. This will be the very first step of your interview occurs, you know, within that first year of being in the program. Um, none of the steps that you're going to go through as far as the testing are anything different than, uh, than any other person who interviews outside of Purple Runway would go through. Um, there is an additional course that you're given that I'll talk about. Um, but as far as the, all these testing events, it's the same thing anyone does when they interview. Um, so you'll go for a day. Uh, the nice thing about that is that Mountain Air Cargo and FedEx facilitate all of these things with you. So I work with them to coordinate, um, hey, we want you to come and do the summit. Uh, we make sure we get you off the schedule. We cover your travel, your hotel, everything for you to facilitate these steps with FedEx. Um, so you go to uh, Memphis for a day to do the summit um, and the testing. In the morning you do the testing and that is, um, the NEO and the cognitive testing is like a personality test type of thing, uh, kind of an HR thing. Um, so there, there aren't any, um, there isn't any job knowledge that's required. So it's okay if you go early on because nothing you're gonna be evaluated on has anything to do with pilot skill at that point. Um, so you spend the first part of the morning doing that. Uh, they'll give you a tour of the facility, you get a meet and greet with the chief pilot. So the latter half of the day is kind of more of a meet and greet uh, and it's to get you excited about FedEx, excited about Purple Runway. Um, so you do that one day step uh, and then they send you back home to Mountaineer Cargo. 
Um, and then pretty much from there, you won't do anything um, with the program, any of the events of the program, until probably the last six months that you're in the program. Um, most of it, you're just time building. Um, at, at that point, you're just flying, you're time building. Um, you know, one of the requirements of the program is that you don't fail any training or checking events. So as you're doing your recurrent trainings and things like that, it's very important, uh, you know, that you don't fail any of those because that would at that point disqualify you out of the program. Um, and we haven't had, we haven't had any of that uh, happen, but, but that's something that's in there. Um, usually, you know, if I, if my pilots that are in Purple Runway, those are the ones I'm going to reach out to for recruiting events or, you know, things like that to help because, uh, you know, they're promoters of the program. So uh, sometimes you get to do some of that fun stuff as well as part of it. Um, and then in the last, uh, once you hit 500 hours of piloting command time, once you pass that milestone, that is when you will start to finish the process of the interview. Um, which the next step would be uh, the jet transition course. So this is something very unique to the program that FedEx invests in and their Purple Runway candidates. It's a, it's a five-day course that you go to in St. Louis at Flight Safety Jet Transition Program. Uh, they pay for you to go there. So you'll do that and then you'll come back. Um, same thing, we facilitate everything for you. You don't have to worry about getting yourself up there or you know, paying for your hotel or anything like that. Um, now, that is the one place where the Purple Runway program agreement becomes binding to you. Um, prior to this, you could opt out, no harm, no foul. You could always apply at FedEx later on. Um, if you decide that you are going to opt out of the program after you've done the jet transition course, you know, they're, they're investing about $20,000 in you for that, um, then it's written into the contract that, of course, they want to recoup those training costs. Um, so, so that would be the only piece of the contract that you sign that's really puts you on the hook for anything. Um, and that is only if you opt out. That is not if, you know, you don't pass any part of the interview process or anything like that. So I wanted to throw that out there because I know that's a very common question uh, about Purple Runway is, you know, what, what, am, I, what am I signing into here? Um, and then after you do that, there's a job knowledge test and then a final interview. Um, so far, we have had a 100% success rate with everybody that has gone through the interview process. Uh, they, all three of them that have made it that far have been hired. So um, we are thrilled about the program. It's been very successful for us. Great. And so it sounds like just to kind of recap that it's it's really beneficial because of the, the requirement of the time in the program. If someone gets hired on at Mountain Air Cargo, that they start thinking about that early on so that they're able mm -hmm. to apply as soon as they're eligible. Yeah. And, and I usually will reach out to our new hires at the six month point and just remind them like, hey, it's time. And, you know, if you're interested, get that clock ticking. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Hey, well, that, that's great. That's fantastic. So um, can you talk a little bit about also how the training process works at Mountain Air Cargo? Sure. Um, yeah, because it's uh, the timelines are very different if from the 208 to the ATR. Um, for the 208 training, uh, they do you will go to Houston for a week and do your in-dot training. Uh, and then you'll from there go a week and a half to flight safety in Wichita. So uh, pretty short training footprint there. Uh, so you're looking at about two and a half weeks there, and then you've got another just a, you know, two or three weeks of, of OE out on the line, you know, aircraft training that you're doing after that. Um, typically, when you get to the OE portion, you're just at your base out of the line, wherever you're at, you know, it's pretty much going to look like your typical flying. You're just doing that with a check airman. Um, so pretty short training footprint for 208. I'll tell you that the OE, um, you know, it's one thing we're going to make sure being that that single pilot that you are comfortable. If it takes three weeks of OE, it takes three weeks of OE. Uh, you know, usually people who have flown 208s before it goes a little bit quicker because, you know, they have some familiarity, um, but pretty short for them. So uh, four to six weeks is, is pretty much it for the training footprint in total for the 208. Um, the ATR, uh, you'll be in Houston the whole time. Uh, the first two weeks you'll be doing in-doc, uh, and then you will do another six weeks of systems and simulators, uh, and that's all in Houston. So there's eight weeks that you're going to spend in Houston uh, doing all that. Of course, you know, we always cover travel and hotels and all of that for you to be there. Um, and then there's about another 
probably uh, three to four weeks of OE after that, again, where you're flying on the line to complete your training. Um, so, you know, you're looking at about a 10 to 12 week footprint there uh, for the ATR training. So much longer than the 208. Um, you are paid your full salary from day to hire, which is typically the day that you start training. Um, sometimes depending on when your training start date is, if it's a Monday, we, we start you on a Friday just so that you're an employee when you travel over the weekend. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's our training footprint. Awesome. Um, what type of support, once someone's hired on at Mountaineer Cargo, what support and programs do you have to really uh, ensure that, you know, your pilots have, have that support system uh, for safe operations? Yeah, we, we have several. Um, and I, I think the nice thing is, is that being that we are a 121 operator, we have some of these programs that maybe just a strictly 135 operator wouldn't have but we carry it over for everybody. Um, so this, that's kind of one of the nice things. If you think 135 operator, our bars probably set pretty high because we try to uphold that same standard across the board. Um, so flight safety training for all pilots. So they do, you know, they are trained at flight safety. Um, and then we, we have our SMS system, which is our safety management system. Uh, we have an aviation safety action program, ASAP program for flight and maintenance. And all of these are accessible in the field. Everybody gets the iPads that you see there. Um, and you know, everything's on our SharePoint site. So all these programs are very, very accessible to everyone through their iPad out in the field. Uh, we also have fatigue risk management program in place uh, and flight operations quality assurance. Uh, so, uh, you know, heavy on the safety, if, if that doesn't say it for you. Um, we have a lot of safety programs, uh, you know, for our, for our pilots um, to help keep them safe out there. Uh, and then iPad-based electronic flight bags. So we are all all iPad-based for for everything. Um, I think even now in training uh, your manuals, you know, instead of when you get to training, you have a big stack of books. You just have an iPad sitting there now, so it's a little bit different. <laughs> hey, that that's convenience of technology these days. Uh, Perfect. Now, can you walk us through uh, also what just some of your uh, benefits? Absolutely. Uh, so this is a pretty common question. Do I get jump seat uh, uh, privileges? Yes, you do. As a crew member, you will uh, be in KCM and CAS, so you will have jump seat privileges. Um, if we send you somewhere for work, you don't have to use those to commute. Um, we, we will, um, you know, book your travel and get you where you need to go if, if you have an assignment that's outside of your base. So those are strictly, uh, you know, jump seats really just for your own personal use. Uh, we reimburse for the FAA medical up to two times a year if that's how often that you need to get it for the first class. We provide a uniform allowance. Um, and new hires have the option to get a personalized leather jacket upon hire. And I tell everybody to do that, even if you're somewhere warm, because you never know when you'll be somewhere cold. Uh, we offer retention bonus as well. So those go on, you know, years of service with the company, but there's one every year and then they increase, uh, you know, depending on years of service. We also offer educational reimbursement. Um, and that is uh, up to $1,300 a year. So if you're uh, still pursuing your degree or you're going to add on to your degree while you're here, uh, you know, that'll be a little bit of help for you. You can get some of that cost reimbursed. Uh, adoption benefits if you're adopting a child and then paid time off. Um, just to talk a, a little bit about that, the paid time off schedule for ATR pilots, you work a three week on, one week off schedule. So you're getting a, a paid time off, uh, a week of paid time off once a month. Uh, and for the caravan pilots, it's every sixth week that you get off. So you work five and then you're off uh, a week. And that is in addition to your vacation time. So um, Perfect. you can go on a vacation once a month. <laughs> awesome. Well, I know we discussed schedules in an earlier slide, but this also this one ties in here to uh, vacation. So how often are schedules assigned and how far in advance would a pilot know uh, theirs? 
Yeah, so the schedules are built at least a month out. Um, and I mean, if you're a base pilot, you know, you kind of know your schedule. Uh, you kind of know your schedule every month, but there are times, you know, due to need that you may be doing what we call floating. Um, and that is where maybe for the week you're going to go to another location to cover. Maybe there's a there's a pilot that's out on vacation or, or you know, out for training or something like that. So you may be going there to, to cover. Um, but the schedule is published on our SharePoint site. Um, it's usually built at least a month out. So you're able to see that. And then as far as the time off, the weeks off, you're placed on a rotation. So um, once you start, once you finish training, you'll know your time off rotation for the whole year. So the way that works is if they say, oh, you're a week two pilot, then that means that you know that every second week of the month is your week off. And you know that for the whole year. So that's kind of nice for planning. I mean, you know, um, it, it's very different. You know, you're not bidding your schedule or bidding your time off or anything like that. It's, it's pretty cut and dry. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for, for going over that. And it looks like there's some other additional benefits here as well. Yeah, um, and kind of wanted to show you guys that, you know, as a company, if you're thinking about us to, to come on board as an employee, we have a great benefits package. There are a lot of, of pieces to it. I, I have put the main ones up here, um, but it's very robust and the rates are very good. Um, so we offer everything, uh, you know, 401k plan. We have health, vision, and dental coverage, long and short-term disability insurance. Uh, we have some voluntary plans that are, you know, group plans that if you want to participate in for accident insurance, critical illness insurance. Uh, com their company does provide life insurance at two times your salary, but you can also purchase uh, more on top of that if you want. Um, there's a health savings account, flexible spending account, wellness reimbursement plan. Uh, that is for things such as your gym membership or your vitamins or any wellness related uh, items. We're actually doing a, a virtual 5K next month, and the sign-up fee for that is reimbursable as part of the wellness program. Um, so that's a really good program. I know a lot of people like that. Um, and we do offer vacation and sick leave. Uh, you get a week your first year, and then after your first year, you get two weeks, and then it kind of increments up depending on years of service. Uh, and and uh, eight company paid holidays. And usually well you are off on those holidays fedex doesn't fly so you know things like christmas day and thanksgiving day and fourth of july guess what you don't have to fly perfect <laughs> well hey that that sounds like a really big benefit be able to uh spend time with your family or go to a barbecue <laughs> absolutely and, and honestly um this brings us to it kind of plays into our next slide which is that you seem like a really fun company to work for. I, I know I was, I'll share with the viewers, I was telling Hillary that I didn't get the chance to meet her at Women in Aviation in person because every time I went over there, there was just always a big line talking to her and, and a bunch of people waiting. So can you talk to us a little bit about your company's values and what it's like to work at Mountain Air Cargo? Absolutely. Um, you know, as you can see, our, our four core values there, um, commitment, family, together, and quality, um, I'll definitely tell you the family one. We, we are like a big family. Um, you know, we are, we are a smaller company. So to put it in perspective, our pilot group as a whole for the, for both aircraft is just under a hundred pilots, you know, as fully staffed. So, um, you know, you're not a number, uh, you're not a seniority number. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know, if I threw any pilot's name out to our chief pilot, he could tell us something about them. Oh yeah, so-and-so likes to go fishing on his days off or, you know, uh, builds antique cars or, you know, and, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, kind of what you, when you meet us, uh, what you feel and what you see is what you get. Uh, it, it's truly a, a family environment, um, very friendly. We're very committed to, to each other, you know, as workers to help each other, as well as to our customer. Um, that's huge. Um, and we're just, a, we're just a very well, you know, kind of oiled machine as a team. We're very cohesive to work together. And we're very, very concerned about our employees. So, you know, from my end of things of being on the hiring and the onboarding, um, you know, and the HR side of things, taking care of our employees is is a high priority for us. Um, you know, employee engagement is huge for us. We're, 
we're very concerned about our employees and that they're happy while they're here and that they you know quality is being one of other core values that we have we do have quality of people and we want to provide a good quality of life for them um you know we know some people are just here for a short amount of time right you know you're doing the purple runway thing or what have you and I, we have some some employees and some pilots who have been with us upwards of 20 to 30 years so oh. so so that says something about you know that they're happy here and that they stay um Certainly. so yeah that we we live those core values that is for sure Perfect. Well, that is amazing. Well, um, the next thing that we'd like to, to share with you guys is just the different ways to uh, contact Mountain Air Cargo. And Hillary, at what threshold would you recommend that interested candidates submit a, a resume to you? And then once it's submitted, how often should someone contact you with updates to their flight time? Sure. I would say when you are about 90 days out, from meeting the hiring minimums. And you'll know, you know, when you're time building, you know how many hours you're flying a month. So you can kind of estimate, hey, I'm, I'm 300 hours away from, from him hitting the minimums, but I'm flying 80 to 100 a month. So yeah, I'm within that 90 day window. Um, so about a 90 day window is good because, you know, it, it, we will interview you prior to meeting the minimums. Um, so that gives us time to get you in for that interview. Um, you know, the onboarding process takes a few weeks, et cetera. Um, so anytime within the 90 day window is good. Um, you know, and I certainly don't mind if, if people reach out prior to that or they have questions or they just want to get an update. You know, what basis do you have available? Hey, when are you getting those 408s? Um, you know, we are, we are happy to answer those questions as well. Um, you know, we, we kind of want to build and start that relationship, you know, early on. Um, so we're, we're happy to share information. But as far as, you know, as far as interviewing, 90 days out is good. And then we can see that website right there. If anyone has more uh, questions, they can view that information. And uh, that brings us to our final slide, which before we move on to our viewer Q&A, um, we do just have a question for you. And that would be, uh, if you had one piece of advice to share with our viewers today, what would that be? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I would say that the best advice is always be thinking about the next step and where you want to go when it comes to your career. So when we talked about time building or we talked about the extra things that you're going to do, you know, while you're at your school, uh, you know, while you're in training, how can you give back? Um, all of those things show to make you a well-rounded candidate. You know, I'm always asked, well, what's going to put me above everybody else? Well, everyone applying has the hours or they wouldn't be applying. So what are those things that, that you can do to make yourself kind of shine above the others? And those are things, you know, volunteer for things, you know, help with recruiting events and things like that, right? Uh, mentor other students. Um, all of those things are gonna help you for the, for the next steps. And, and like I said, definitely be conscious of how you're building your time. Um, make sure that it's, it's helping to develop you for the next steps. Perfect. Well, thank you for sharing that advice with us today and for sharing information generally on uh, flying with Mountain Air Cargo. Um, we'll go ahead and we will move on to our viewer Q&A. And it looks like the first question um, is, do you also, which I know you discussed this a little bit, but maybe just to reiterate, uh, you do welcome long term. It sounds like you had a couple guys that uh, ended up or girls that ended up staying long term with Mountain Air Cargo, correct? Absolutely. Um, yeah. And like I said, we, we have people, you know, 10, 15, 20 years that have been with us. And we do have that to where if you're in the ATR and you get 65, well, we can say, hey, come and fly the 408 or the 208 or something like that. So we, we definitely welcome, um, we welcome that. And then um, it looks like this is from uh, Facebook Live from one of our, our students, our student or future start, um, I can't remember, but do you have commutable schedules? Do you have anyone? Um, not really, because it's, it's a daily out and back. Um, so you really have to be at your base location during the week. So it's not something you can commute in. I mean, if you want to get a crash pad and go that route, certainly you can. Um, but you know, you're going to be there Monday through Friday at that base location. Okay, perfect. And then, um, if, so, oh, this is from Nathan Hayden. Um, if 
someone is submitting a resume and a cover letter, or, uh, would you recommend the cover letter as well? And he said, thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> um, yeah, um, you can send a cover letter. Those are great because it's your opportunity to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Um, you know, a resume only says so much. So, so definitely, you know, and I, we do look at the cover letters and, and take those into account. So um, it's not required, but if you want to send one, then much appreciated for the extra effort. Perfect. And then Jose would like to know, since uh, you mentioned that the flying is done primarily at night, what does maybe a, a daily schedule in terms of hours look like? Sure, sure. We do have a few schedules that are day, um, but, but they're just a few. Uh, most typically they're overnight. So show times range anywhere from say 8 p.m. at night. Uh, you know, now the, it's going to vary. Show time, I'd say anywhere between 8 and 11 p.m. depending on where you're at. Uh, like I said, it's usually just a one hour flight and then you may have a layover at, at your destination. Anywhere like a quick turn may just be a couple hours and you're coming back to an overnight. If it's an overnight, we get you a hotel, you go and you get some rest, and then an early a.m. return. Typically, everything is back at base by around 7 a.m. There's a few stragglers at 8, but 6 to 7 a.m. in the morning, okay. most typically everything is back. And if someone was interested in finding more information on uh, things like pay scales, where are they able to do that? We do have that listed on Airline Pilot Central. The pay scales are on there, uh, as well as the bases that are on there. Just keep in mind that all bases aren't open all the time. It just, like I said, some of those only have a few crew members. So it's basically where we have an opening. And is that something, so if there, um, if you had a class where there were multiple um, pilots that were going through training, how are bases assigned? They are assigned upon interview and an offer letter. So, right, you will come in, you will interview for that position, and you will, you'll know. So you'll know going into training from day one where your base is going to be. So that's kind of nice. It's not like the lottery and you don't know, right? <laughs> um, okay. And do, um, oh, so if someone was potentially a rotary transition, how do you, um, do you count rotary time towards the total time? We do, yes, um, and that would be something, uh, we kind of have a little niche there. We, we actually have a couple of rotary pilots that came to us and started out in the caravan. In fact, one of them is our one of our purple runway pilots because um, you don't need the 250 hours of PIC time, you just need that 1200 hour total time, you know, rotary or fixed wing, and then you can build the time in the caravan and transition over to the ATR. So yes, we do count it, yes. Okay. Perfect. And um, do pilots assist in the uh, loading process? No. Now, you do not have to load everything, but as the pilot in command, you are in charge of making sure that it is loaded properly, that the cargo is secure. Uh, you know, the caravans have nets in them, things like that. So, you know, it's kind of a it's pre-flight, you know, duty that you're going to make sure that everything is secured properly, but you do not do the actual loading of the cargo. Perfect. That was from Cameron. He's one of our, our awesome alumni. So, hey, Cameron. Hey, Cameron. <laughs> All right. And then, oh, he says hi back. <laughs> um, how has the COVID pandemic impacted your current and foreseeable hiring um, numbers for pilots? And do you foresee a majority of uh, immediate openings being maybe picked up by, um, I guess, or, or, are you entertaining hiring those that are uh, coming from maybe major airlines or regionals, whichever? Good, good question, Trevor. So um, we were fully staffed before COVID-19, um, you know, and that was just, you know, being a smaller pilot group, we were fully staffed. We were hiring to attrition. Uh, and then when COVID-19 hit, some of those pilots that were leaving to go on to other places did not leave. Uh, and so for a few months, we kind of paused hiring. So really our hiring depends on our attrition currently. Uh, and we, yeah, we don't have that many positions open because it's just as people leave, you know, we might hire two or three here or there. Um, and, and that's, and that's simply, you know, we have a smaller pilot group. We don't have 1200 pilots. So, you know, we, we need 50 every month kind of thing. Um, and as far as, you know, are we hiring furloughed, uh, you know, regional pilots? Um, not necessarily, uh, you know, because our thinking is, well, we want long-term employees or people that are gonna stay as long as they can. And, you know, the thinking there is, are they just gonna jump back to their airline, you know, 
and, and then I, we're going to need another pilot again. So I, if, you know, I, I've gotten that question a lot from students, you know, they're like, well, you know, all these pilots are going to take all the jobs. Not necessarily. Perfect. Well, that's good information for anyone that's tuning in as an instructor. So um, what is something that you maybe think that people fail to consider when looking into cargo operations? Um, I think maybe they, they don't understand the, the schedule and the route structure. Um, I, usually when I explain that to people, they are pleasantly surprised. So I think it's something people don't think about, um, you know, and they hear from the regionals a lot, like, you know, the word is out there, everybody knows that. And we're kind of over here, you know, you know, in the corner, like, you know, nobody knows what the cargo people do. And uh, actually quite a few people have been pleasantly surprised at, um, you know, our operations are very different. Um, and sometimes that's just a better fit for them. Okay. And it looks like Jonathan T gave you a shout out on Facebook and said you're great. So uh, he says hi. Um, for, as we're approaching uh, the end of our hour, can you actually just go over the interview process with our viewers? Sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, that has changed a little bit with COVID-19. We're doing everything virtual. Uh, usually we would do in person. Um, so typically that starts with, you know, you sending me a resume. Uh, we'll call you for a phone screen, uh, you know, make sure that everything is a fit, you know, that you're, you, we'll explain to you the base locations and the openings and the schedule and if all is well. Uh, next steps is we'll get you set up with the, the chief pilot. Typically, the interviews will be uh, chief pilot, assistant chief pilot. We'll kind of have a couple people from the flight department on that. Um, as far as the interview process and questions, you know, there's some standard HR questions that we ask. The technical, I'll tell you, will be very focused in on instrument flight procedures. Uh, you know, be able to talk and walk, walk yourself through, you know, an entire approach procedure, uh, you know, everything from the approach briefing right on through to the missed approach. Uh, really looking for, like, like I said before, solid skills when it comes to that. Um, so being fluent in your procedures is key. Uh, that's going to be where a lot of the interview is going to focus. Um, as far as any aircraft or system site questions, um, they'll usually look at what you've flown most recently and maybe ask you some questions related to that. Uh, you don't have to know 121 regulations. You don't have to know our aircraft per se. If you have flown a caravan before, I hope that you better be, be uh, brushed up on it because they will ask about that. But um, and then typically, um, like I said, we're doing all that remotely now. Typically before we'd actually fly a candidate in for an in-person interview. So when things go back to normal, that would be the process. But um, basically after the, uh, the technical evaluation and the interview, if all goes well, then uh, you know, we would look at what class dates we have coming up and at that point assign an offer letter and a, and a base location and a start date. And is that the, the same day or is that a couple of days after? Typically a day or two after once we kind of regroup about the interview, but yeah, I, I do like to let people know very quickly because I know how it is to be on the other end of waiting to know how your interview came out. So, uh, you know, uh, usually I like to give a 24 hour turnaround if I can, unless it's like a late Friday afternoon interview or something like that. But yeah, I usually like to let everybody know pretty quickly. Perfect. Thank you. Well, I think we have one, one last question as well. Uh, Nathaniel would like to know for the, the nighttime, um, the 100 hours, uh, is it similar? Is it broken up like ATP min, 75 and 25? And so, um, especially with you doing both 121 and 135 ops, how uh, does that play into the, the landings? So, uh, Nathaniel, that would be true. If you were looking to go into the ATR, you would be able to use the landings credit, yes. But for the caravans with the 135 minimums, no. Perfect. Awesome. Well, then we are wrapping up our hour, and uh, we had a lot of great questions. I just want to say thank you so much on behalf of all our viewers for, for taking the time to speak with us today about operations at Mountain Air Cargo. It was great to, to hear that information and that you guys are doing well and that you're getting those uh, new aircraft and even upgrading some of your fleet. So thank you so much for joining us today, Hillary. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in.
Thank you. And so if anyone has additional questions, as uh, was on that slide, you can go to mtaircargo.com to find out more information about Mountain Air Cargo. And uh, for future webinars, you can go to atpflightschool.com webinar. We hope everyone has a great weekend and fly safe. Thank you.